No, you're the only homie I know that has worked with Jay Diller. Eight Mile, you had that, you know, kind of um, trailer parkish thing going on back then. And then the further you drove out, you just had the nice suburbs. Thing, nice. You know, and we were like somewhere 23rd, 27th mile. And <laughs> I remember like a car driving towards us with like a few white girls and they were waving at us. I asked what you, I was like, why are they waving? And he's like, they don't never see no N-words out here. <laughs> and I was like, okay, <laughs> that's different. And then we came to, to that house and I was in that legendary basement studio. All the plaques on the wall <gasps> of my favorite albums from Buster to Dela to Tribe Called Quest. And he played us some new shit he was working on. I left the iPod there so I know when Dilla's, uh, you know, whatever, he left for people somewhere. There was a little white iPod that was uh, filled with my music and uh, music I listened to at that time. Killer Killer Podcast. Killer Killer Official .com. You need the Kellervision app. 24 7 mini documentaries, podcasts, live shows, DJ live streams, top fives, subscription packages, plus products for all your podcasts and street culture sports. Download it from the App Store for free today. Yo. Nolan Poland Records for underground classics. NoPolandRecords.com. Beatbox created. And we need to talk about world music and street culture. Killer Keller Podcast. Ready? Let the trouble commence. Ladies and gentlemen, Killer Keller Podcast, live and direct, central London, or as central as you need to be, choose to be, want to be. You don't want to be anywhere else. We're actually on location at the moment. <sighs> Cameras on, and we are at the VIP um, backstage at the VIP store, North London, Tottenham for your sins, the home of, uh, of all the paint uh, needs you need in your life. Um, big up Pirate Studios, pirate.com. Big shout out to Tr Strain Station, <laughs> strainstation.co.uk. Big shout out to nopolandrecords.com. And anyone that's got a television app, you know, it is 24 7 street culture, the sporting art. You can get it all there from uh, mixes to podcasts, to mini docs, Android, iPhone, free download. Inside the house today, um, I'm going to make no bare bones about it, this man is a superstar. Across the gas regions, Europe and beyond, this gentleman here from Hamburg, arguably, I would say, is uh, is the, um, well, I'd put it on the Snoop Dogg of, uh, of Deutsch hip-hop, but a craftsman in all forms of hip-hop rocking, I've had the pleasure of hanging out with him, had the pleasure of joining him on stage in some of the biggest events um, across Europe. Ladies and gentlemen, Germany's number one, Sammy Deluxe, inside What? the place. Yay. <laughs> Thanks for the intro, bro. Where to begin with you, my brother? We've been through so much, and, you know, our friendship spans at least since 2004, 2000. Yeah, somewhere around that. I think that's where we met the first time and collaborated. Yeah. Um, Yeah, to just give the people a little roundup. Do um, it. I'm like second generation German rap. So like when I went to my first <coughs> hip hop concerts on stage, I saw like the really first guys rapping in German, you know. So and I started immediately. That was like in uh, end of 92. I saw hip hop the first time live on stage. That's when that spoken first generation was on stage. And then uh, I started and like uh, perfected my craft together with my DJ, DJ Dynamite, for like a few years in our basement. Mm -hmm. And like, then we came up with a demo and started doing shows from 95 on. So like I started wow. in June 95, I had my first show. And back then, like the little scene in Germany was so connected that like uh, in every little city you had like some youth, like recreational center or something. Right, okay. And, yeah. um, and the bookers of the shows would be the rappers in the city you know really so like like it was a really like self-sustained little scene and um every gig we did led to the next gig a few weekends later you know so oh. so and then we did that like for five years and it transformed into like this bigger growing scene and we i was like the first generation um with a few colleagues of mine from my city and other cities that became like commercially successful so like By the end of like 98, uh, Freundeskreis from um, Stuttgart um, in the south of Germany became very successful commercially. Mm -hmm. And 99 uh, beginners from Hamburg became super successful commercially. And we were kind of uh, not like tail riding, but like 
they took us under their wing and we mm -hmm. could open up for for their tours and stuff. So that exposed me and my group Dynamite Deluxe at that uh, point to a bigger audience. And our first album came out in 2000 on a EMI major label. Wow. And uh, went like number four in the charts and sold over 100,000 records. And like we went on solo tour, uh, on, on our own tours mm -hmm. after that. And uh, the year after, I already dropped my first solo record as Semi Deluxe in 2001. And then I became like super successful and was like the biggest rap star in the country and uh, also like won all the big awards and like gold plaques and this and that. Mad. And so from, from that point on, it was very established and German hip hop became to, uh, yeah, began to grow even further. And then like from 2004 on, Till 2004, I was like, me and a few other people were kind of like the main spotlight. For real. And then like the the whole gangster rap in Germany came up and a lot of, uh, you know, our main foreign population is like Turkish and uh, Turkish people. Yeah. So a lot of Turkish and Arabic rap and um, more like street related topics um, started coming up. And I was still like successful and I, I still am, but like not on that level where like in the, in the beginning of 2000s where it was really like, you know, Everybody that knows hip hop knows me, and now it got so big that, of course, yeah. it's like a whole lot of bubbles and niches. Yeah, there is. Yeah. There's a whole lot of niches. Um, although I will say this much, um, I guess the I guess the comparable is what UK Garage was to us: uh, original drum and bass, jungle music, mm. uh, our General Levies or our um, big uh, up General Levy. all day, all day. Um, you know these kind of um, household names that were ve are very fucking cool and. And also, there wasn't any genre mm. of its time that that really grabbed the German language like mm. hip hop did. Very true. Yeah, there, there's a huge difference between how much like great lyrics and and poetry like from the Beatles on, and mm. probably even like further back, mm. and and even like great. Um, of, Germany has great, great literature too. I was about to say like Shakespeare and shit, but we have good and and Schiller and a lot of cool people but like musically um, I guess you guys over here have a way more to relate to than we have you know mm -hmm. like and uh, German rap kind of defined itself also by being very anti whatever the mainstream music mm -hmm. at that time was and incredibly relatable to young young people that even yeah. even now I mean and I, I only watching or and did as a young person coming in from UK into Germany just the the scene the, mm. it was so massive like you guys I mean Grimes having its and Drill's having its thing at the moment yeah but I'd say it, 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 it by comparable of like a, 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 a local um, a local genre mm. a, a, a Germany was just holding it down yeah man in like hip hop I was very pleased to see that, like in the last decade, the UK fans started appreciating their own artists more. Because, mm. like for me, yeah. from the very first, uh, not the very first, but really early in my hip hop fan career, mm. like I started listening to rap maybe at like '87 or something. It was like uh, Fat Boys, Run DMC, Ice T, Public mm. Enemy, mm -hmm. um, and then like a few years later, I already. Uh, discovered hijack yeah, yeah, yeah and yeah, then yeah. like in the early 90s it was like gunshot killer instinct um son of noise like all these legendary uk yeah. what they call britcore at the yeah, yeah, point yeah. Well, we knew it as britcore i don't even know if that yeah, what it was called britcore yeah it was i used okay. to love that genre yeah man it was like Sirens really out really shit. dark and like kind of like the same um breakbeats that the Americans used yeah. but they did it 90 BPM and over here you did it like at 130 <laughs> BPM <laughs> yeah. and like mad raps over it and it influenced me a lot because also the whole stance was like very political, very mm. anti-government mm. very anarchist, you know yeah. Silver Bullet, yeah, also one day. of the ill spitters from yeah, over here big time. and then like in um, the early 2000s I we were connected very well with um uh, Black Twang, shout out Tony Rotten, yeah. Teddy Ted, Teddy Shawnee Ted. T, mm -hmm. and we took them on tour on my first uh, big solo tour in 2001 wow. um, with also Casey the Rookie, who yeah. is also a UK rapper, but he uh, resided at that time in Germany. Yeah. And uh, D Flame was on there too, and D it was Flame. like a, a, a lot of legendary artists coming together for a tour. Mm -hmm. And um, I remember vividly, like one time I was here in London uh, with Tony Rotten from Black Twang. 
and he was opening up for uh, Ja Rule, who was like at his commercial peak. And I could really see like the people like not appreciating the local craft. And then as soon as Ja Rule got on, like he did his playback show and before Tony's like a world-class MC, yeah. you know, like really yeah. you can put him anywhere in the world and people be like, whoa, that's a dope rapper. And like people weren't appreciating it uh, That night, like, you know, it wasn't his crowd. Mm. And then, like, Ja Rule came out, did a, like, super weak show. And the loudest point where the people were screaming the loudest was, like, where he just lifted up his platinum chain that resembled, like, this electric guitar. And I was like, wow, man. Like, mm. and then came back to Germany and, like, our scene was so, like, vibrant. And, like, yeah. people were really coming out and celebrating us German artists on, on a higher level than yeah. they were uh, doing like American artists mm. and they were really like relieved in some way that finally somebody was speaking their language literally yeah, you know that's right literally and metaphysically you yeah, know yeah that's right so um, yeah that was a huge difference and so like maybe like five six years ago I got more back into like UK music and Skepta and stuff like and I was really like pleased to see mm. they have huge success and yeah, they like the people here appreciate it and the people overseas appreciate it they do don't and that's of course the potential that uk rap always had that german rap doesn't have so like my market is germany austria switzerland mm -hmm. and then all over the globe i met people who also listened to my music before because yeah, of yeah. course now the internet connects us but all, like but, me, but, but also yeah. you could be walking down the street in england and you get recognized like You, you're by Germans, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. for real though. Like yeah. in Holland, actually, I got recognized by like Dutch people before, black Dutch people and stuff. So because, like, there's like a lot of people that also like check out like the neighboring countries and mm. the good rappers, but mainly like uh, like where <laughs> Germans stay the well everywhere on the on the planet. So like <laughs> yeah, yeah. even in a like uh, village <laughs> in Kenya, I got like recognized and like on the Times Square in New York and everywhere. I mean. It, it, To, to the to people that are just joining into this 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 conversation with Sammy and getting an understanding the gravity of, of this character and, and what he uh, uh, represents in Germany um, I, I can only define it in in my experience of coming into Germany and the, the power of German hip hop um, curse Steber twins mm. like you said D flame um, Tony torch. L torch yeah, yeah these man, the first one. These, these crazy names and you were the top of the fucking tree, bro. And I didn't even, I couldn't even comprehend it because I was so small me at the time just doing like toilet tours, <laughs> you know, and you guys were so, it was like, yeah, like Busta Rhymes level mm. of of PR campaigning that major labels, labels mm. were taking you guys on. I didn't even think for a second that I'd be collaborating with you. I, for me, it was just unthinkable. It was like, mm. I, I didn't even, I couldn't even compute that you were into UK hip hop because German hip hop was so seismic. You know, I just thought that, mm. you know, it was like celebrated in the same way, I don't know, pop stars were over here because it really mm. was that big. And, uh, and then we connected and that was a real fucking moment for me bro like, it was like yeah that's crazy he knows us you know yeah yeah that was that was great to connect man and i think the first <laughs> thing we did was like a freestyle or something before viral times we probably would have gone viral in the <laughs> hip-hop scene it was like a nice freestyle that i mm -hmm. did over a beatbox from you and then like a few years later like the craziest mm -hmm. thing uh, or the second craziest the craziest what we did is actually my MTV Unplugged yeah. which we maybe talk about later Hell but yeah. like uh, I don't know like maybe 2000 like seven, mm. eight or something mm. we uh, did a thing on the EMAs the European Music Awards mm. in Munich where Snoop Dogg uh, yeah. just had like drop it like his hot was like his hottest hit on the planet and he brought us out like he introduced mm -hmm. us now killer keller from the uk sammy deluxe from germany mm -hmm. and uh, you dropped the drop it like his hot beat with the beatbox <laughs> yeah. and i did a freestyle which i actually fucked up because i had like a few bars written and then like after two bars i messed it up and just did a freestyle but i think it fit more also life because yeah, the did. energy because i kind of had to to talk to the crowd in the room rather than yeah. to the tv audience i felt yeah. and yeah it was a nice moment man and uh and since then we yeah we we always cross path again yeah, we here in london in. and or in germany yeah. yeah it's homies and then came the unplugged show um but we'll get more into that in a bit you've your career with dynamite dynamite deluxe um and that transferal into your solo period yeah. which has become today you, you're The seminal. It was almost like Dynamite Deluxe was your uh, 
uh, leaders of the new school. And then, and all then of a sudden, yeah. <laughs> you know, and then all of a sudden... You... Yeah, that was... Actually, I never thought of that comparison, but it makes a lot of sense because even more so because I was the rapper in Dynamite Deluxe and had two producers, but mm -hmm. like since I was uh, the, the mouth and also very loud mouth compared mm -hmm. to everything else, not only in German rap culture, but in German culture, like there wasn't a lot of things at that time mm -hmm. said politically or just like in a... You know, like in a in a tone where everybody's like, "Well, what the fuck mm. is he saying?" Like, I was very like Big L inspired, Heavy. very um, like like a mix at that time, probably like um, between like Karis One and Big L. Like, I like that really like life stamina and like reggae influences like KRS. But like at that time, I was so like every line was very very sharp and every rhyme was very unique. And mm. you know, like German rap hadn't been like. There wasn't a format to it, so I was kind of like the first one to really make it flow. If mm. you look back at it, Torch had an ill flow, but still had like these moments where after five lines or seven perfectly flowed lines, there's one line where there's like eight too many syllables, yeah, and he's yeah. like, blah, 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 you know? Yeah. And I was like the first to really get like a linear. solid, you know, yeah. very linear thing, like to make it feel like the American stuff, because Bounce, German, yeah. German does flow a little stocky mm -hmm. like you know a little yeah, heavier yeah. than 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 english doesn't roll off the tongue as easy but like if you work on and choose the words wisely and, mm. and really count your syllables and do the math behind it then i kind of cracked the formula and since I was, that. that's a pioneering move you know? yeah man definitely and and since i was so focused within that group thing i felt like it, it kind of restricts me to to be in that group you know and even though my first solo album from like 19 tracks that were on there i think the bulk 15 or so were produced by Tropf and dynamite mm -hmm. who were my producers in the group before so and i always kept on working with them but like it had to be like a solo thing mm. Mm -hmm. yeah it did because it was too it's like a caged animal it's just like you, yeah. it, it was almost like more defined yeah. position and like you said that you were a voice that had not been uh, had not been um uh uh discovered yet it, you had not you were putting a lot of time into the deconstruction and reconstruction mm. of german rap so it's Definitely. palatable and also like the the skin color factor is also like a thing like they there wasn't a lot of people in, in that generation before me that like were on TV and speaking their mind and like also like like freely and openly smoking weed <laughs> but like I was also like from a solo album on in 2001 I also got invited to talk shows because my biggest hit on that album and commercially biggest hit up to now uh, Weck mich auf um, is like a very German social critical analytical song really? and that became like a huge hit and so I got invited into talk shows and was kind of like the spokesperson, like if they needed someone from a young generation, even with a mm. migration background, but still articulate, but still cool because yeah, yeah, I'm a yeah, rapper yeah. and stuff, then, then they poster always boy, got me. Yeah, I was yeah. the poster boy for this. Oh, yeah. See, we don't deal with poster boys on a podcast, see what I'm saying? We don't deal with them poster boys. And you're the only person I know, you're the only, f well, oh, no, no, let me think if I know anyone else. No, you're the only homie I know that has worked with Jay Diller. Oh, yeah, man. That's crazy. That is a super privilege. I don't say that man. shit lightly on a podcast, neither. Yeah, man, I got goosebumps as Yo. soon as you said it, man. Because, How did that like, um, um, Afrob is uh, a great German rapper, one, actually, my favorite German rapper, like, uh, live Big and on Afrob, record. Yeah. He's, a, he's a great performer. He's uh, Eritrean, but um, uh, raised in, in um, Stuttgart, also the south of Germany. And I'm from the north of Germany, Hamburg, and we met around like 99, I think, and started a project together, a group, ASD, Afrop Semi Deluxe, uh, in 2002. That's and in 2003, it. our album dropped. And in that production period, we were in the States a lot, and we worked in uh, Detroit with uh, Wajid, who's like a pro <gasps> protege of Dilla. And he produced uh, five or six tracks on the album. And we were in Philly and worked with some producers there. And we were in New York and worked with Diamond D, DR Period, <gasps> and Mr. Man from the Bush Babies there. And then we came back to Germany, finished up the album, and also did some stuff with DJ Desu. And there was this crazy dude, like... Uh, um, What's this? Ramos. I don't know if you ever met Ramos. Ramos. He's like a, a a guy from New York, black guy from New York, and he's like the middleman 
of like he's the greatest middleman of all time. Like he just knows people and, and, connects and gets paid off like connecting people. And like um, he was in Berlin at that time and also like connected with Desu and came in the studio and was like, yeah, you guys work with so many American producers, you have to work with Jay Diller. And we were like, yeah, how? <laughs> yeah, like and, how? Tell and, me. And he's <laughs> like, yeah, know. he can fly in and blah, blah. And he connected it. He hooked it up. Um, Jay Diller and Frank from Frank and Dank came Heavy. to Berlin and Frank spent and three days with us in uh, D DJ Desu's legendary old uh, studio in Berlin. And um, we did two tracks with him. And um, the thing is, before he came, he said, like, yeah, I need this amount of money per beat. And um, and I think, of course, cash. Yeah. And uh, a lot of <laughs> weed, you know. And so, like, I do smoke a lot of weed. And my AKA uh, since the 90s is Sam Similia. So, like, for me, <laughs> a lot of weed no, is know. a lot of weed, you know. So yeah. I brought them a big bag. And they were only there for three days. They gave me, like, half of the bag back before they left. Mm. And uh, half a year later... A single came out from Frank and Dank. It's called Push, produced yeah. by Jay Dilla. Huge. Huge song, right? Huge. Second verse, he's like, um, with the shit that bang in your trucks when I'm in Germany smoking weed like Sammy Deluxe. It's and true. I'm like, yeah, it's man. fucking true. So, and it's Yo. like on one of their biggest hits. So, like, I definitely left an impression on the weed smoking <laughs> side. You know, he didn't say anything about my rap abilities. but in Engraved in history, yeah, man. in a tune. So, that is really great. And then, uh, I a year later I was uh, at Wajit's place for a month to record my next solo album after the one with Afrop that Huge. was like in the end of 2003 and um, me and Wajit went to visit Jay Dilla at his house and we drove out because you know they, they have those miles in Detroit right like 8 mm. miles and then the further you get out the nicer it gets actually you know like really yeah, so the yeah, central town's the worst so central town's the worst and then at 8 mile you had that you know kind of um trailer parkish thing going on back then and then the further you drove out you just had the nice suburbs thing, nice you know and we were like somewhere 23rd 27th mile and <laughs> i remember like a car driving towards us with like a few white girls and they were waving them i asked to watch it i was like why are they waving and he's like they don't never see no n-words out here <laughs> and I was like, okay, that's different and then we came to to that house and i was in that legendary basement studio all the plaques on the wall of my favorite albums from Buster to Dela to Tribe Called Quest and he played us some new shit he was working on I left the iPod there so I know when Dilla's uh, you know whatever he left for people somewhere there was a little white iPod that was uh, filled with my music and uh, music I listened to at that time that's and so, incredible yeah, so I was really blessed to, to meet him two times and yeah Oh, is he like a person? Super quiet, man. Like, I only remember one scene from the time in Berlin uh, because me and Afro were huge fans or are still huge fans of the Fantastic Volume 2 Slum yeah, Village course. album, wow. right? Super classic. Mm. And uh, Afro, at some point, asked him about, I think, the song Players yeah. with those choirs you know yeah it's like yeah blah, blah, blah. i think i know where you got the sample from but somehow like with the choirs and stuff how did you do that and and he was on the mpc and just looked up and he's like yeah <laughs> <laughs> and looked back down again so like that's the really the only real memory uh, of him like you know conversing <laughs> and it's just, just like one syllable and i would have just hit, he, I just he said it if all I, if i was afro i would have just run away and hid it's yeah, like that's, well, how do you take that shit? It's like, yeah. <laughs> yeah, man. Shout out Jay Dilla. Rest in peace, man. That was really amazing. And uh, also, wow. even you you didn't ask me about it, but I also have to bring it up. I also uh, met Sean P. So that was Yo. like my super rap hero and yeah. like Jay Dilla producer and rap hero. And um, for DJ Desu's album, Art of oh, War, wow. and back in the days, I did a track with Buckshot. D Flame did a track with Sean Price, who wasn't, Sean Price at that time he was Ruck of Helter Skelter yeah and we actually yeah. a Ruck yeah, right? yeah, yeah with you and we actually thought because D Flame has that deep voice that it would be a cooler match if he had Rock you know yeah yeah. Uh, and and we weren't di weren't disappointed but it's kind of like oh okay we thought the other one well he's good too yeah. and I remember like uh, DJ Desu had like the the beat on a reel still mm. right like mm. two inch reel yeah. tape old school for those and we were in D&D &D studios legendary in New York you were in D&D &D? yeah man oh dude D&D &D studios oh. and um, and 
that's you put the reel on the machine and you know you kind of have to put the tape in and click mm. clack and then he pressed play and as soon as the beat started playing like Sean Price was sitting there on the couch and he just like performed for all of us in the room he just started rapping and I really at that point I, I've been rapping for so long but I'm like a very shy quiet dude usually you know I'm more the observer than like coming yeah, in the were, room yeah, and yeah, trying yeah. to get attention and like I really learned rap in a different way that day because I, I was like oh shit he's just like he's not like performing only when he's on stage like me like that's his craft he uses yeah. to entertain people yeah, wherever yeah, yeah, he yeah, is yeah, yeah, yeah. and the shit was so animated you know he was like yeah and then take it in the padlock and kick the bitch off the bike and you know oh like he did every move God. and we were just like in awe i think that's you still has some footage of that shit but like wow like those those moments like dilla and sean price like and of course, I, I met countless other like of my heroes, but that's, those were like some super close mm. encounters, like mm. that, uh, yeah, that, that I really cherish, man. Because mm. hip hop is the dopest shit ever, and yeah, we're yeah, just yeah. blessed to be in it anyway. But then, when you meet those really like you know yeah, it's cornerstone huge. people, yeah. for real, um, the the young, the young Sammy, the Sammy that was super impressionable mm. in 1987, 88 listening to Run DMC, listening to Hijack, listening to, you know, Rakim. And then you're positioned through the organic development of the German hip-hop scene, through those youth centres into, like, it's a common question to ask, would you have ever have thought? But the, I think the... the what What... Would you, were you ever prepared for it? Like, because, you know... Nah, the thing is, like, it was so gradual, you know? Like, yeah. in the end of the eight, uh, 90s, I could really tell, like, if you came towards me and I was walking, like, on the... in the train station, you know? Yeah. And then somebody comes towards me and he wears baggy pants and a hat cocked to the side. Then I was mm. like, he will probably recognize me. Mm. But nobody else. Yeah, yeah, I yeah, was yeah, like, yeah. you know, like, just a normal yeah, 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 guy yeah. to everybody else. And then in the beginning of the 2000s, when I was in talk shows, then all of a sudden, like, old people recognized me too. And then, like, uh, like in the 2009 or so, at that point, I, like, I did an album that was very reggae-influenced. And I one mm. song that kids really liked, you yeah, know? Yeah, like, yeah. grown people bought it, but, like, also their kids could listen to it because yeah, yeah. a lot of my shit is explicit, so it's not really kid-accessible. But that song was just, like... So all of a sudden, I, I, I like, you know... 8 to 88 mm. and but it was really gradual so and in the year that it really exploded where I could have been way overwhelmed and had like a rock star kind of yeah. you know it's true thing. this is all fact people yeah. this is no fuck about this and, is and, the real deal and the same year I married got a son so I was very grounded in mm. that way you know like yeah, out good. and about and like getting awards and shit but then coming home and having, having to change diapers and yeah. you know getting yeah shitload in my ear because you know i haven't been there and you know so yeah. i was always like not feeling as popular as i was because my private situation was very challenging well aside from this the, i mean the, the private situation is private but um is that is that is there a level of um bittersweet there that because you had these duties mm. ones that you wanted to be a part of and had no choice because it was your family but there was this grounding. Does it was hindsight twenty twenty with this, where you could say to yourself, "Well, maybe I should have taken more advantage or of my position, as long as it didn't kind of damage the relationship no, with the I, kid." Yeah, no, yeah. It's always better to to focus on the on the family thing and then stuff, and then. Yeah, you know, hold tight, Billy. You know. My guy. <laughs> we'll get into why we're here at VIP in a bit, but yeah, I yeah. guess um, like I said, hindsight is twenty twenty, and you've got to think of the family, haven't you? Yeah, so so I'm pretty happy the way it turned out and everything I might have missed out in those days. <laughs> I definitely took mm -hmm. care of later. Mm -hmm. And so I don't, yeah, I feel like I had a very uh, interesting career because I also got, you know, I'm 44 now and like in 2000 would have been my 25th stage anniversary already. So wow. like, like Fuck. you know, yeah. it's like. I did a lot of shit already, like, and I never had a bucket list. But if I had, then I probably would have scratched off every mm. aspect of. That's of interesting, the bucket list, because, um, and I've said this before to a couple of people on podcast. Um, big shout out to all the regulars. 
Do, would you say there was a level of PTSD coming down from something so seismic and po- in terms of popularity? You know, where you had to, all of a sudden, you know, you have ticked everything on your list, mm. your wish list, and you have succeeded. You've gone over the mountain, you've hit the highest heights. Mm. Is there a level of PTSD to that? Like? Like, like... Like feeling you don't have it anymore? What you Yes, have? yes, exactly. Like, like you've done it all now, what the fuck mm. do I do? Oh yeah, that definitely, but that came in the last two years with me like not having the chance of like staying in the flow of my career because I always, my shit is like album, tour, album, tour, album, mm. tour uh, and rarely took any breaks and if there's any breaks in my album discography, there's like mixtapes in that times or like I had a label with other artists that mm. I was putting my focus into and I was always in the flow and the last two years definitely slowed me down and gave me a lot of time to reflect on how I want to spend like the next 25 years mm. but like um, when it comes to the fame thing which was when you start so high then it always has this fading effect you know yeah. like when you like in everybody's mouth and ears and eyes at some point then everything after that could feel as like a um, like a downgrade yeah. but for me since I'm a very private person I enjoy every year more that less <laughs> people recognize me and especially since young people don't recognize me anymore like the, mm. the you know like 16 and 20 year olds um, like my life has gotten way more chill and uh, I live outside the city mm. anyway and I live a super like you know secluded mm. life yeah, no. because people were really in my business a long time but now when I walk like in German cities or actually in London too like I get like photos like a few times like here in the last four days I've mm. probably like met like six to eight people who wanted to take pictures go, so see. Germans are everywhere but it's not that it's not stressful anymore mm. and the, also the other thing is like for me because I'm big on legacy and also big about like on self-empowerment like my um, status financially and self-worth wise increased while the hype and fame decreased you know mm. because i handled my business well like in the in those years where i had like super um success on every level i also had like super tax problems on on every level right. and then a few years later i had a divorce which was like very expensive and time and nerve consuming and and like yeah, my biggest concert ever was actually right before corona hit in the end of uh, 2019, on my birthday, 19th of December, uh, I played the Barclay Card Arena in Hamburg. I played it too. It was <laughs> yes, fucking man. sick, bro. Yeah, we it, killed that shit. Yes, definitely, man. And, and that was like the last show of, of the MTV Unplugged thing. So, mm. so actually, like, I did, like, still, or am still, like, achieving things I haven't achieved before, yeah. you know, because... It, like not everything is about hype like when you're really like a good live performer in germany at least that platform is there and you have worked for it and mm. it kind of pays you back you know yeah, like does, if yeah. i want to play like a festival season next year with a new album then there's definitely a lot of festivals that will book beautiful. me no matter if i'm like top 10 or you know yeah. not even in the top 100 because well i mean there was a renaissance and like you say it's it's a it's a sword that you can draw from any time Mm. And MTV came a call in, and they I felt them, man. I forced them, <laughs> forced the hand. Eh? I doubt it. I tell you something. You came through the doors of that of that show with such a catalog, and I rem- moments like I remember hearing some of these songs on tour, mm. and it's all like it brought me back. Mm. And I think for a lot of people in the arena and watching it on TV, it, I don't know. Correct me if I'm wrong. But there certainly felt like this um, new energy of, fuck yeah, man, Sammy's our boy. That's mm. our, that's our, that's our mm. export. That's our mm. celebrity. And it, I don't know, not that you weren't a quote unquote serious artist. It was like all of a sudden, now you had a sense of regality. Yeah, man. You but, know what I'm saying? I really actually did force MTV to do that. Really? I never got asked because my time where they would just think of me, like, who's the next one to do it? They would always just think of somebody who's, like, really in the focus of the mainstream right now. When I drop an album, it will be top 10 yeah. for a week or so. Yeah. But then, you know, like, it'll fade, and I'm not, like, the super hype, like, ever, haven't mm. been since, like, like my last album that went, or the first album also that went number one was in 2011, 
And like every other album always like goes top 10 or top five, but I'm not like, I also don't like doing a lot of commercial TV shows. Mm. Like the, the whole level entertainment wise is very low in Germany mm. and I don't feel like playing so many playing part of game. their bullshit yeah. games, you know? So like, um, mm. and um, I really told my, like a part of my management team, um, Sophie, I said like, I'm really predestined to do this shit, like to do, have an MTV unplugged and it would be kind of like a night, you know, like when the queen yeah. uh, gives you the night thing. Yeah. And um, and I have like one of the illest live bands I already played since 2009 with a live band. Hell and so yeah. after my album that I dropped in 2016, I said to Sophie, like my next shit, like I'm already working on new songs, but somehow I feel like I have to do MTV unplugged. Can you get me a meeting with the person in MT at MTV that's responsible for those mm. unplugged? And we got a meeting with uh, Mara and uh, I... And she said she loved my lot of, lot of my songs and my catalog, and especially because I have like a lot of features with all the big artists that ever yeah. like throughout German yeah. rap and pop and soul history. And um, she saw a lot of potential of me bringing all these people on board, which I did. And um, then I had to convince once I got there, okay, I had to convince Universal to pay like uh, upwards of a half a million to Ooh. make their Whoa. shit come true, just for the production and yeah. And after convincing all those people to invest in me in a way uh, that would just boost my life career, where, yeah. of course, MTV or uh, Universal wouldn't participate on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I somehow convinced the right people and then made it work yeah. and, and really fulfilled a lot of my, all of my, actually, on that for that particular thing, I did have, like, a bucket list. I did want... Maybe one US per act, like uh, uh, try to reach J Electronica yeah, that would and crazy. Rhapsody. Yeah. Like, Scratch was there though. DJ Scratch was there. Yeah. yeah. Big up Scratch. Cool, yeah. yeah, man. Big up DJ Scratch. Yeah, he was DJing the after party. It just felt like a homecoming. That's what it felt like. It mm. felt like everyone from the German hip hop world was there. Um, it's funny, you got, me me and my, my girlfriend, Lisa, we were, we were there and. Um, the, the backstage in, in a German hip-hop show is way different to the UK one, mm. right? So Sammy had a bar, a free bar, drinks bar in the backstage. <laughs> but you guys weren't really drinking. You were just smoking on a sofa watching the TV. Me and my girlfriend on the other hand, we were like, free bar, let's go. <laughs> bar, you yeah. know what I mean? We were like literally there. Yeah. We were propping up the bar. You guys were just chilling and smoked out. I was like, yeah. yo, no one's even drinking. We're the only That's so different to a UK show. Yeah, <laughs> show. man, free bar over here probably is way more, yeah. Yeah, My people mainly smoking people like maybe at an after show party mm. some drinks will flow but not not on a regular pretty chilled and bro like it was seminal so for me it was a seminal moment to see um all the friends of the, of the german world which you know <laughs> i didn't realize how many people you know we knew to collectively mm. and yeah. and had been such a big part of your career yeah. um so yeah man it's the, the, the future's bright and you're probably wondering people what we're doing here at uh, VIP Graffiti mm -hmm. well the man like Dirty Sammy nails Deluxe, man yeah man we, we've we been got painting. our nails yeah we gone painting yeah. and so so how long have you been doing graph? I actually started like tagging and like drawing graffiti and photographing pieces and like doing my own little graffiti magazines kind of thing crazy uh, in the 90s like early 90s before I rapped and then I started rapping and yeah, that was I, I did beatbox, graffiti, DJing, producing, and then rapping kind of last, and it kind of st stuck with me the most and gave me the best feedback in a way, yeah, you know, yeah, like. Yeah. And then like five six years ago, I started getting really back into it, and especially like first time really painting. Mm -hmm. Back in the days, it was like maybe a piece, two pieces a year, and now like I, I really like I'm a serious graph writer. Yeah, you are. <laughs> Deadly so. And yeah. it's funny how you and me have the same creative, <coughs> we have the same creative path. I think there's a similar desire mm. that you and me both share. And I think that is, um, correct me if I'm wrong, my desire is to, at the time, think it till you become it. Then you become it. Mm. And then you realise how lucky you are that you have this culture called hip-hop that if you want to do art, you can do art. If yeah. you want to do music, you can do me and it's all channeled in this thing mm. that always gives back yeah man i love that about hip-hop too and especially like for people like us who paid their dues already in one element mm. like 
we get a lot of support by the people who've been doing it and that's all I always want to do it for, you know. Yeah, I never people, give yeah. a fuck really what a fan, you know, quote unquote or listener thinks. Like I'm always like I just want to have rappers who really know how hard the shit is yeah. for them to admire my shit because if you're just a listener, like of course I'm, I'm you know, like I respect everybody and yeah, I yeah. love people who just listen but I can't like appreciate your criticism in a way that I could appreciate it from yeah. like somebody who really does the craft you yeah. know, and knows it and owns it and so like yeah that's a beautiful thing yeah. peers that turn around to you and say yeah you're all right. you're, you're doing good I got so much support man like like, yeah. like one of the illest writers from Germany Atom One ooh uh, Atom oh, yeah man he's, he's so also hard. like a, he's a really legend and he's, legend. he's connected with one of the big uh, paint brands and like uh, I wow. posted a early when I posted like my first graffitis again like a few five six years ago and I posted like a big box I got like a huge mm -hmm. carton of like uh, paint you know and I posted a pic of it and like he said like yo bro you don't need to like buy it every time we can send you like a whole load and then a few weeks later I get like a yo. few and it's like yo Atom man hook a kills up man let's yeah. do this and like a lot of like when, when I when was traveling still like a lot um, on tour uh, people would just hit me on IG and be like yo I see you're in Freiburg tomorrow I got a big wall oh, here and uh, I got paint and blah 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 yeah. so like it's, it's really like a great a recreational thing that you can do everywhere because we were talking about this earlier you mm. said that you can't just come here and jump into a studio i mean we could probably yeah. find something and i could book a room somewhere but and um but it's, it's still like graph you can just do everywhere yeah. in the world you know just it's quite a some spiritual thing isn't cancer. it it's, yeah 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 totally yeah. totally that was kind of the first you know you sent me a message and you were like yo i'm in town do you want to paint and like <laughs> it doesn't even it's like yes <laughs> yes yeah. because Right, going in the studio or something, that's a lot more thought. There's a lot more thought involved in that, isn't there? It's like, okay, so what are we going to do? How are we going to do it? How long is it going to take? How long is the studio for? Sure. Where's the studio? What also, do do? from my perspective, like, since I, I'm, like, successful in my stuff or have been so long, like, I, I've kind of become used to the fact that I have to pay for everything in music, you know, yeah, I don't have to pay to real. paint with you, but, and I know we're friends, I don't have to probably pay you right away because you trust me and mm -hmm. you will get your percentage when when record comes out if we do something, yeah. but somehow like going into the studio always has to do with me like really like paying to, yeah, yeah, to yeah, be yeah. able to do it and in Germany also the way I set myself up, I like I have a huge studio with a few rooms, like it's an old studio that are like old rock and roll studio from the 70s that so I turned sick. into like a sick hip hop place and um and i just like love to work you know autonomous and and not have to autonomous you know, yeah, and not have to like pay people for every move so i learned everything like how to produce and mm. and i know the worth too of buying beats from a great producer of course right yeah. now i'm back way more into that leaning way more into like buying beats because mm -hmm. uh, I also have these critical artist phases you know where mm -hmm. in between I felt like I was the illest producer and right now I was like yeah there's better people like I just want to oh. be a good rapper and just like Hone the craft. buy a nice beat that yeah. I like and you know yeah. yeah I think we've all had those moments for sure yeah, um, yeah man I mean Viva La Sammy Deluxe without question <laughs> Um, and yeah, anytime you're in town, you come see me, my brother. We'll get painting, we'll get doing yeah, it. Yeah, man. You definitely hook me up, man. Yeah. Also, yeah, shout yeah. out uh, to the Strains. What's the Strains called again? Mm -hmm. Strainstation.co.uk. Strainstation. Hold tight. Yeah, man. <laughs> Big up, my guys. Got a good hook Thank up. Thank you much. And of course, Billy VIP. Yeah, man. Hey, yo, that was such a cool day here. And this is like an amazing spot for everybody that hasn't been here at VIP, like from the from the human aspect of it like it's really just a great hangout spot and he's got like the illest selection of paint that i've yeah. seen in a while like yeah yeah, yeah. one of a kind can't get it anywhere yeah. else yeah. so on that note ladies and gentlemen we're going to be out like out of fashion from an audio side of things but from a video side of things we're going very very uh immediately outside so killer killer podcast out like out of fashion you stay on the line there video viewers for the rest of you on the audio Big up Sammy Deluxe inside the place. Yo, shout out Kels, man. And this is a great podcast, bro. And yeah. you're a great uh, great media personality. And I really enjoy your content Thank you, on brother. Instagram. And I'm uh, very like inspired by, by your growth. And oh, I blessings. think there's going to be also some collaborations on, on that media front. Yeah. We should definitely, yeah, we're exchange definitely change a lot. We're going to do some talking. We're going to do some talking. Ladies and gentlemen, Killer Killer Podcast Outlaws in with that out of fashion, all right? You stay lucky. Don't talk to anyone. I wouldn't. Be safe now. Peace. 
Right, and as for you guys, stay right there and on the video front. Get the glasses out! Go get the glasses! Madness in the house, man. Come Sammy on. Deluxe in the house, people. Yeah, 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 yeah. Come on, man. Here we go. Sammy's coming with the bits. Come on, man. Come on, man. Come on, man. You dare, Sammy? You got this. Where is he? He's coming. Come, I got the cops, man. Come on, bruv. That's why we call it VIP. That's it, bruv. Most of it's on the table. Pop in, pop in, pop in. In on your register. Cheers, man. Cheers, brother. Good health. Good health. Cheers, cheers, Sammy.